Bleach job. Hello and welcome to the video that will probably drive you insane. Today we're having a look at Eternal Undying Love by Brett Keane, which is the second worst book I've ever read. And the reason that I'm saying it's the second worst is because I know that there is this kind of inevitable thing where I'm going to find a book that I will think is worse, and I don't know when that is, but I figured I might as well not just say it's the worst book ever, knowing that that's probably going to happen at some point. It's kind of in the same way that some evaluations don't actually give 100%, but 100% is kind of there just in case, and 99 is really the highest that they go. One of the things that contributes to this being the second worst book is also the person who wrote it. This person is worse than the person who wrote Empress Theresa, if you know what that is. That's probably the third worst book I've ever read or part of a book, which whatever thing is on the guy's website is what I read, and it's pretty bad. Anyway, since I usually talk about movies, TV series, and games, I even though I read a lot, I don't really talk about books in videos as much, so this is kind of a first time thing. It's probably going to be a little bit more disorganized than I'd liked, but I'm giving it a try. I have a lot of stuff to get through, as you can see. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about who Brett Keane is, give a little overview into the type of stuff that's going on with him. It's important for me to do that because there are particular things like fake reviews and scams having to do with the book itself that will give important context. Secondly, I'm going to be talking about the concepts, mistakes, hilarious spelling errors, hilarious wording, and all of the stuff that makes it a bad book, just stuff like that, formatting errors, everything of the sort. And lastly, I'm going to actually be reading a plot summary written by myself from having to slog through the book. I will demonstrate here. I have eight pages. Each of these is double-sided. I have eight pages to get through of the plot, so I'm gonna leave that towards the end, obviously, because it's one of those things. It's like a cancer threshold. You have to kind of keep building up the strength by introducing little things. If I just read this to you at the start, your head would explode and that would not be very nice. You think you know what is going to happen, you have no fucking idea. So let's talk about Brett, Brett Keen. If you're a Drunken Peasants fan like myself, you already know where this is going. If not, you have no idea. So now we need to think about early YouTube, like early 2000s, and the old school atheist community as it's kind of sometimes called. Obviously the religious and atheist debates are still going on to this day, however they are completely, in their approach, they're very much different. So, so that's why I'm really talking about them in different ways. This is the old one because it gives you an indicator over the time. So everybody was kind of doing their thing back then, and then out of nowhere comes this guy called Brett Keane who starts making videos. He says that he lives in the deep south or somewhere around there and he starts making content because he's an atheist now and he used to be religious and there's a bunch of things he has to say. So this keeps going on. Brett Keen gets kind of popular, not really as popular as he says that he did, but kind of. And it soon comes to the point where people start noticing really weird things about him. Firstly, if you criticize him even in the slightest, you get completely banned from his channel and posting comments. Secondly, people would find on his website, his blogs, his channel itself, he would recite poetry and lyrics that he claims that to have written himself, but as you go into it, you can see that he actually stole these. Plagiarism was a really, really big thing, and, and the kind of controversy stuff seems to just follow him. There were a lot of stuff to do with money, where he would ask for money for certain things and pretty much look like scams. He would also call people child molesters and claim that they had child porn and they were rapists and all this sort of stuff just because they stopped being friends with him with, you know, natural falling outs as you have. But for him, it just wasn't that. He had to make sure that they were known as a terrible person. And with all of these things, people kind of started to realize Brett Keaton is not that great of a person. Now, fast forward to the book. The book came out and it's obviously self-published. He made the cover himself, I think. And he said that it was originally something that he started writing when he was in high school and he was still religious back then. He said that people loved it so much when he showed them that he had to kind of put it into a book format and make it a piece of writing worthy of being a novel and then publishing it. And all these reviews started popping up and these reviews from publications from everywhere, they all looked the same and they were all praising his book. And then when people looked into the profiles that were making these reviews, they figured out that there was really, really good evidence for them being fake. These publications didn't actually exist and whatnot, and there were a couple one-star reviews that really seemed to be more honest. That is something that I've seen a lot with Kindle self-publishing, and I'm gonna be- if this video goes well, I'm gonna do another video on the worst of the self-publishing from recent times, because there's a couple that I really need to talk about. But anyways, that happens, and then he has this weird kind of crisis where he says he needs money and because apparently Christian people were the ones who donated to him the most. So he's religious again now and that is why, because he got money from these people so he's like, I'm gonna believe what you believe purely because of money. And he's had a couple of run-ins with the drunken peasants. Um, obviously I'm being extremely general with what I'm talking about here because the extent to all the drama is just, 
it, it would require an entire video, which is why I made one. I made this ages ago, so it's not the best, but it does actually cover a lot of the stuff that he's done if you want to know more about him. So you can go and watch that. The Drunken Peasants actually said that they watched it, which, which made me quite happy. I'll leave a link to some more stuff on that, including stuff that they personally have done. They've had some really good guests on the show. I first found RPG Minx through them, and I really like her content. She's one of my favorite people. So let's go through some of the reviews. After Brett Keen put this book out, to my surprise that I would not be interested in any particular category of fiction. I am a person who only likes non-fiction books. When I bought the book home, I could not put it down. The book had a certain void that pulled me towards it, feeling some kind of black hole being drawn towards me when I started reading it. It was the book that made me want to go deeper and deeper into the book and the unknown void. I realized I could picture myself in the character's place and time. Brett Keane knows how to move the reader, putting them in a place where the characters would be at a particular situation. The characters in the story are based on something unknown. To move the reader, I would recommend this book to anyone who loves to read horror fiction. A brilliant book few will be able to understand. This is by far the magnum opus of the world-renowned author Brett Keane. In my opinion, he rivals and even surpasses William Shakespeare as he strategically develops a complex plot while simultaneously creating riveting, intellectually intriguing, and memorable characters. This is a must-buy for any intelligent readers who enjoy dark, tense, complex, and roller coaster book. That doesn't make any sense. Full of surprises and moral quandaries. I love it. This book will change everything you believe is true or thought was true. It will scare you and horrify you. It will entice you, make you rethink everything you ever thought was true. Is God really good? Is there any hidden agenda? You need to have to read this book and decide for yourself. I couldn't put it down. It confronted me with something I never actually thought about before. Is God good? Is there a conspiracy of evil hidden behind the veil that we can't see? Worst of all, I'm being watched by some unearthly presence that wants me to think it has my best interests at heart. Brett Keen has a vivid imagination and the ability to make horror to a whole new level. A great book, a great writer. Excellent. Great. Eternally brilliant. This book is excellent, a true masterpiece. The characters are great, very scary, even the good ones. Because in epic battle, you never really know just who the bad guy is. Interesting read, no let down. Now that we're done with going through the reviews, let us look at the actual description and the blurb that Brett Keane has written for his own book. It says the following. In the small town of Quiet Meadows, a gateway to hell has been opened. The rise of the Antichrist takes place as the demon army try to take control of the world. Can Detective Stalker and his rookie partner Dawn save the human race from the inevitable? Discover the planet Gilgothica, a world inhabited by vampires. Read about the war between angels and demons for supreme control of Earth. This book will take you to hell and back. Book incorporates vampires, demons, and many other mythological creatures. Books? There are multiple books. There's the trilogy by Brett Keen, also at Amazon.com. He says writing on Amazon. So as you can see, it seems like your kind of average stupid young adult fiction wolves vampires thing. I personally cannot stand those, but there's a market for them. But this one is, it is gothic edgy bible fan fiction. It really is. And the funny thing is, he was religious at the time when he started writing this, but it just, it looks like he hates Christians, which I mean personally I'm not really bothered by people's opinions when they write stories, more how they write them. I still follow a lot of the kind of atheist and religious debates because I find them really interesting, especially from the perspective of being an atheist myself. I really want to see someone else's perspectives, so I'm completely fine with seeing someone's opinions no matter how extreme they are. I go out of my way to kind of find the most offensive opinions and read about them because I find them interesting. So it's not really that I'm bothered by the particular topic that is being told here, but more just how it's done. I believe that you should write about anything and everything and you shouldn't really avoid certain words purely because of the political correctness behind them, but if you're using them in a stupid way, I'm gonna get on your case pretty much. So let's start with the portrayal of the main characters. For some reason, every single character talks about God for like five pages. They just have this massive conversation about God and they're all completely edgy about it. They all go on about how is God good? Is God allowing suffering? Or is it the devil that's allowing suffering? I have suffered so much, no one understands my pain. Every single character has those sorts of discussions and it's all, it's, ah. Uh. Brett Keane was a religious at the time, yet whenever he brings up religious people, he always talks about how hypocritical and stupid they are, yet the characters who are supposed to be the good guys originally say that they hate God, but then towards the end of the book they suddenly love God and they suddenly say how amazing he is even though he's portrayed religious people and god so far as terrible so it's kind of like what do you even mean what what are you talking about like what do you actually believe it's fine for characters and people who write books to change their minds over the course of writing it but there needs to be evidence for them actually undergoing change if they suddenly just switch it's so confusing so as soon as the book opens he goes on about christianity and why all christians are hypocrites because they're all drug dealers and alcoholics for some reason all of the characters are just mouthpieces for his own opinions and and 
the opinions of people who I think in his life have been mean to him or he is taken as hating him at some point so he puts them in his book as villains. Like the entire thing is just projection. The characters that are bad characters have no good side whatsoever and then the good characters are supposed to be good yet at the same time they're all super edgy and they've always done something in the past that have made them suffer but they deserve to suffer and they know it and stuff like that and whenever there's a character who's relatively normal there's always a comment from one of the char other characters like the edgy characters going such innocence is not ready for this and it's just I, I don't get it the book begins in a schoolyard setting and there's a bunch of teenagers in their various little groups around the school waiting to go inside he talks about each click that's hanging out together and he spells click c-l-i-c-k as in like click and not social gathering click that's something you should expect spelling errors and obviously every single click has to be an extreme stereotype so there's the goth click there's the christian click there's the jocks there's the cool kids black people are all in one click like they don't interact with anyone else they just we'll get onto that later though i don't want to get ahead of myself there's them um there's just this random guy called tim who everyone hates and the jocks bully apparently i don't know why he's never heard from again as well he's not an important character the book just goes on about random people as if they're going to be main characters and then they're just not like all of the jocks start beating the shit out of this guy called tim and lighting his books on fire and then they never mention Tim again, like Tim just doesn't exist then, poor Tim. So there's a Wiccan girl walking past the Christian clique. And remember, every single time a character does something bad and they're Christian, Brett will continuously go on about how it's the Christian person that did something bad. It, he doesn't let it go. So the Christian character says, go to hell, Satan bitch, to the Wiccan girl as she walks past minding her own business. And Brett goes on this weird bitter tangent about how all of these people are exactly the same and they're all hypocrites because reasons. I understand he would definitely have some contact with religious zealots and religious zealots are fucking crazy and there's a lot of them in the world there are really a lot of them but still this is a really bad portrayal like even if he wants to specifically portray religious zealots he's not doing a very good job especially when it comes to him kind of trying to come across trying to say that his faith is good as well like he's just not coming across with that point either but anyways the exact sentence is Go to hell, Satan bitch, one intelligent Christian said. Susan the Christian. Really, that has to be a qualification. So then the Wiccan girl does not let this slide. She goes into some high school drama saying, was it God's will to make out behind the sports building with the captain of the football team? And then the Christian girl gasps. And then it's followed up by, the Wiccan girl was pissed but didn't get violent. Instead, she turned and gave her the bird. Another thing here is the horrendous wording and grammar. If you have two characters who have the same pronouns or the same gender, you need to qualify which one is which when you're seeing who's talking. For instance, if there are two girls and one of them is actually an older woman and one of them is a young girl, you need to qualify that every once in a while saying, you know, she went up to the old woman or the old woman looked at the young girl or whatever so that you're not using she because otherwise it would sound like this. She went up to her and she said to her that she felt this way but she didn't know that she felt this way so that's what she told her. Th that doesn't make any sense, you have no idea who's talking. But if you said something like the woman stood next to each other, the younger girl said to the older one, the younger girl said what was troubling her expressing her mind to the older woman like something like that trying to trying to say who's who without having to muddle up anything else that's, that's something that brett doesn't do so it comes across as if the wiccan girl was flipping the bird to herself she's like she got pissed off so she started to walk away and gave her the bird one example of one of the weird rants that brett makes about christian people is the following the majority of the parents could care less not couldn't care less so they do care but they could care less couldn't care less is what you're working for. I do not understand how people find this so hard to do. The majority of the parents could care less, for they themselves were either alcoholic drug addicts or perhaps middle or lower class individuals. Because apparently being middle or lower class is um, something to be ashamed about. So now we're going to talk about the black characters. Wow. Okay, as I said before, there's some sort of weird projection about Brett's own beliefs and he pretends that it isn't in the book, but it it's clearly is. Brett always mentions them as the blacks. So just the blacks and nothing else they're always sticking in a group it's as if they're a hive mind absolutely none of them have any original character besides one of them and the only reason that he is apart from the rest of them is because he has a scene where he is extremely violent and shoots a bunch of the other characters that's how black people are written in this you know that i'm very far away from what you'd call sjw i guess and so if you're writing as a racist character and you're using language like this because you're writing as a racist character to demonstrate racism that's perfectly fine to use that and you can use as many derogatory slurs or everything as you can because you're trying to demonstrate 
what it is like in that mindset. If he perceived all of these black characters to be that way because he's writing from the perspective of someone who's like, you know, actually racist against black people, I would think that's fine, but this is Brett trying to be an omniscient narrator, so this is Brett trying to be someone just telling the story as objectively as possible, and so in his mind objectively as possible means that black people are all the same and they're all thugs. Like that's how he writes them. But no, let me give you some lines and some evidence to back this up. So the first time you get introduced to the black characters is in the first page where it says the blacks blared the base for hold of the state of Missouri to hear. At one point later in the story one of the black characters runs up to another like white main character and the white character is like so like what, what did you do what did you hear and the black character responds with and I quote I ran as fast as my black ass could carry me and then the white character says something else and the black character says you trippin trippin spelled t-r-i-p-p-n at another point the blacks are all walking in a group down the street and this black girl goes up to this car that they're all looking at and she starts banging on the window to try and see who's inside she's clearly in danger but obviously because all of her friends are like that they all just stare at her ass as she goes away as she gets kidnapped like that that's what they do because obviously they would do that you know what i mean there's because why not also one of the funniest things is that even though brett has this extremely well racist viewpoint of of black people it seems he has the audacity to say that he has a bunch of characters called the black people niggas at one point and it's implied that brett seriously has this mindset of he can do whatever he wants to portray black people like he can say that all of them are thugs he can say that all of them just don't help each other out and are lewd and not pervy and are just like thugs or whatever but the only thing that qualifies as racist is if you use a derogatory slur so if you call them a nigger that's when you're racist but when you do anything else that's fine that's what it comes across as because all of the racist characters don't actually do anything else they don't go out of their way to harm the black characters they don't go out of their way to actually harass the black characters unless the black character is like walking around near them that's when the, they'll start doing the slurs and everything so they're not actually as bad as brett is because brett's going out of his way to like make them be portrayed in a specific sense and yet again he has the audacity to say that the racist characters in the book are racist and he's not. And honestly, this is even funnier because, as I said before, the thing that he does the most is allegations. He makes allegations about child porn and everything towards people he doesn't like. And one of the things that he makes allegations about the most is racism. And at one, at one point, I forgot about this, I forgot about this. At one point, the book spells nigger as Niger. Like, the nationality? Like, he just completely overlooks that. It's, it's... Ugh. So now we're going to be talking about the horrible spelling, the hilarious spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes and just weird stuff in general. So the entirety of the book looks like this. As you can see, the indentations are not correct or just not existent whatsoever. The paragraphing is completely random. He'll sometimes make a new paragraph mid-sentence because he doesn't actually know how to use paragraphs. It's just him trying to make gaps in the blocks of text to make it look like it's professional because he thinks that's actually what you do. As well as that, there are random page breaks for no reason. He has lines of dialogue without quotation marks and they're all on the same line so one character can say hi the next character can say hello how are you and it would be on the same line next to each other and you'd have no idea who was talking it's time for formatting books correctly with tara that's me when submitting your manuscript to an editor to try to get it published you need to do the formatting in the correct way this isn't exactly mandatory but it makes it easier for the editor to read and thus you might get a little bit more of a chance of getting it published you have to use double spacing you have to use Triumph's new roman 12 point font and you have to have every paragraph indented correctly you also obviously have to have the best grammar and spelling that you can do and you have to make sure that everything is readable and neat. If you are self-publishing, you don't need to do the double spacing because you are your own editor, but you need to do everything else, but you need to do that to make sure that your product is up to standards and worth the money that people are paying, even if it is free. If you want to keep your readers, you need to have a good reputation of actually giving them a quality product. Remember kids, as long as you do things properly and you don't act like Brett Keen, you'll do great. I have faith in you. Everything is just crammed together and it's extremely hard to read. There's a frequent mix-up of words in this as well, like let me read you a few. Um, two and two, your and your, 
different forms of the, there, there, and there. Sometimes accidentally just saying the word the instead of there or instead of a for some reason. Um, the word click or click as I mentioned before. He mixes up words and phrases like there's a line when he de is describing how a character is scared. He says shock and in terror. He uses the word kazoom, which I didn't think was a word. He says cause instead of because. Now I say cause when I'm talking sometimes and I say cause when I'm texting someone sometimes, but when I'm writing an actual professional work that I want to make a product for people, I'm going to use the word because. Unless it's a stylistic choice, like one of the characters has an accent or something. You can play with grammar and make it incorrect if the accent is the thing that you're trying to convey. It's an artistic thing. This is just being lazy. Brett seems to know English less than that Russian meth head who goes around in public places and makes noises like invasions of the body snatchers. And I don't think that guy knows where he even is 90% of the time. Brett also doesn't know the difference between apostrophe s and normal s, like when saying something is belonging to someone else, like with the apostrophe s, or when it comes to its and its. Once he said a web they had wove, let me read you some of the sentences that make absolutely no sense to me. He walked melodically, as if the wind had carried his awesome torso, whimpering like a one-legged dog. What? He spells the name Damien as Damien or Damien sometimes, and I don't know which is which half the time. He spells along like it was a long time, as along as in they walked along, with, as one word. At one point he spells the word away like they went away, as a way, like I have to find a way to go over there. He uses the word injected instead of interjected, so a lot of characters just sound like they're injecting their words into each other's arms, like, like hello Cindy injected, like Cindy just picked up hello, put it in a syringe and injected it into a friend's arm. There's also a lot of spelling errors, like the principal was scared skeptic and how could how could how could have you not noticed i actually had to concentrate to make that mistake i kept correcting it in my head when i was trying to read that he uses the word literally a lot especially when he means figuratively as well he just uses literally let's not forget that this man i think is around 40 years old now he says the phrase smiled shortly or frowned shortly a lot even though that doesn't make any sense and he uses the phrase cold as ice fear when describing someone who is scared. He puts random particles and titles in front of people's names, like the Damien, the Satan, uh, Amy, and stuff like that. And he spells contradict as counterdict. Again, drunken peasants fans will know this. There's also another line, my favorite, my favorite line. The teens watched ominously as the sun hid quickly. Finally, we're gonna be talking about all of the edgy crap that the characters like to say. As I mentioned before, all of the characters are just hardened cops or like some stupid shit that doesn't make any sense and no one's actually like that. It is worse than My Immortal. I mean, again, if you want me to, I'll do a video on My Immortal because apparently I like to drive myself to suicide by reading terrible literature. I'll gladly keep going along that road if you find that entertaining. Obviously, all of the evil characters are completely one-dimensional. They have absolutely no feelings whatsoever that aren't just evil. None of the characters are introduced whatsoever. It's just like Jenny went over there and it's like, oh, hi, Jenny. Who the fuck is Jenny? Why didn't you introduce- I don't know who Jenny is. Why should I care about Jenny? But then, because like, th that's one of the main characters, right? And then there's, you know how in movies you get those extra characters, like two characters will be at a cafe and one of the extras walks past and you never see them again. They're not meant to be a main character. They're just some extra that is filmed in a restaurant, right? Same sort of thing, he'll just have these extra characters lying around and he'll give them full names, but then he won't give half of his main characters last names. So it'll just be like, Martin Jennings walked past the corridor and it's like, bye Martin, what, why do I know your last name? I don't care. There's this particular part that I wrote down here. Um, there's this character whose name is Biff and his nickname is Moose, which is somehow important, but there's a scene where he is standing and talking to someone else and they're engaged in a conversation. And then it randomly, next paragraph, cuts to the life story, like the actual life story of this kid called Steve. And it goes on about Steve and what he likes and dislikes and everything. And then it just randomly goes back to talking to Biff again, and you're like, what, what happened? Who the fuck is Steve? Like, who, who the fuck is Steve? And then Steve is randomly there in the scene afterwards, like, they just add him in, and it's like, Biff said this, and then Steve spoke up, and you're like, who the fuck is Steve? The edgy writing as well. Let me read you more excerpts. The town could have been called Nursing Home Haven. But if you ask a teen or adult what they called this place, 90% would say hell. Also, another funny, funny thing. Whenever the characters get injured, no matter if it's a tiny thing or not, they always explode with blood. Like, someone scrapes their knee and it's suddenly just like blood everywhere on the floor. And it's just, it's blood just flies around everywhere. It's worse than an anime. It's just like, Cindy got a paper cut.
There's a main character called Damien, which is a, a Gary Sue or Mary Sue, however you want to say it, uh, of Brett Keane himself. It's a self-insight character of Brett Keane himself who listens to the exact same music as Brett does, has all the favourite songs that Brett does, um, grew up in foster care, which I, I think Brett said that he did, I don't know if that's actually true, but he said that he did, or wore the same type of clothing that Damien did. It's basically a self-insight. But Damien is an edgy man who has suffered a lot, but he's the chosen one who can only save the day and no one else can. He also gains a lot of superpowers, he has demon powers, has a black Cadillac. He dies like 70 times in the book and is resurrected again, like each time afterwards. And then he just comes to life and dies again. So he actually falls to hell at one point. He's just falling to hell and then he manages to go up and rise again to kill some of something or another. He first appears at the beginning of the story when the teens are hanging out at the school before going into the school and he's driving the black Cadillac. He goes up towards the teenagers and the teenagers are like, oh, what, why is there a black Cadillac? Why do I hear heavy metal music? What's going on? So they go up to the car and they find out that the exhaust, the exhaust is bleeding. The exhaust pipe has blood coming out of it because of how edgy it is. Then he winds down the window and throws a cigarette. The cigarette goes, like actually flies onto the boobs of this girl who's walking by with a shirt that I quote, a shirt that exposed her breasts. And the cigarette like catches fire on her boobs and she tries to put it out. I don't know why that happens, there's no reason for it. The car then moves to a group of black people, the group of, you know, the blacks. And the thing happens that I explained before where the girl gets in, like she goes up to the car and she's like, hey, who's in there? And she starts banging on the window. The window opens and she like leans inside, like the window goes down and then she like goes over. So half of us in the car and half of us out of the car. She's described as having an extremely short skirt. So all of the other friends of us are just staring at her ass in her panties the entire time. And then Damien reaches, grabs her ass and drags her by the ass into the car and drives away and kidnaps her. And then we don't see her again for like half the book. And as he does so, he drives away saying, I will be back. Damien, because he wears black, I think he's described as wearing black shirt, black sweater, black boots, black socks black jewelry and spiked jewelry. He is referred to as the man in black or the man with black, which because of the time that this came out again, like ages ago, um, Stephen King's The Dark Tower series, I think was something that was still being written. So I think that like, I'm not, I'm not saying that I, it's a certain thing. Like I'm not even, I'm not even trying to say that I'm hundred percent certain that this is the case, but reading through this, because of the way that the man in black was mentioned, I I personally have the opinion that he stole this from Stephen King, with Stephen King's character, the man in black, especially because of the way that he's described and the, the way that he's like impossible to catch. Like in the first book of Stephen King, the Dark Tower series, the gunslinger is going across trying to find the man in black and it seems like it's impossible. It's written in the exact same way. It's it's a ripoff in my opinion. Again, I don't really have that much evidence to back it up, but I'm pretty sure. So all of the characters ask each other if they're religious and they talk about it. There's a character called Christian who has a shirt that says Jesus saves on it and shocker, spoiler alert, he's actually Lucifer in disguise. And there's this interesting juxtaposition of Christian wearing all white and deceiving everyone into thinking that he is God or something. And then Damien's the one who's wearing all black, but he's actually the good guy even though he like rapes people and kills people. and So Lucifer and Satan are apparently different people. <laughs> Satan is like actually Satan and then Lucifer or Christian as he's called is like the henchman. Christian kills Satan with a dragon and becomes the new Satan. As I said, I'm going to be going through the plot later with you and you will see that I'm not lying. God in these books is introduced as like an evil entity, like think twice about God. Perhaps he's the evil one all along, but then halfway through the characters are like, no, God is great. Damien or Damien or Damien is described as having a large physique, make of that what you will, and he storms into the school cafeteria. So what basically happened before is he drove back, he drove off in his Cadillac and then all of the kids went inside, they had class. For some reason, at one point, the windows explode and no one cares. So then Christian walks in and he's like the new student and everyone's like, who's that guy who's wearing white with the Jesus shirt? And then Damien bursts in and the lights explode. So all the lights are out. Remember, the lights are out. The lights are out. Damien walks in. One of the bullies, Biff or whatever his name is, tries to stand up to the newcomer and Damien like pushes him against a wall and injures him. Damien goes up to Christian and then he's like, oh my god, Christian fuck you and then Christian's like hey, fuck you and then they have a fight. Damien like teleports out of the room but the lights are described as having gone out as he teleported even though they went as I said remember they went out when he came in. What other lights went out? How can the lights go out twice when they never went back on? And the funny thing is he didn't even teleport 
like completely away. He teleported to his car, which is parked outside, and he drives away. So all of these people just see him teleport, they run to the window, and they just see him get into his car and drive away. Not only that, but like in the span of like 10 minutes, he keeps teleporting in and out of the school for some reason, and then just leaving. Like the first time he teleports out of the school, the second time he teleports back into the school behind someone for some reason, and then he walks out the front door, like he doesn't even teleport out, he just walks away. This happens like frequently, you'll just teleport somewhere and then he'll walk out and then he'll walk back in and teleport out for some reason. So the principal of the school is like, who is this intruder? Why did he like punch my students or whatever? So he catches up to Damien before Damien walks out and he's like threatening Damien before they start fighting. He's doing like a shit talk, like a wrestling promo. And for some reason he keeps talking about how he's going to do things to Damien's ass. Like, it's not meant to be sexual, but it is. Let me read you some quotes. I'm going to stomp a mud hole in your ass and walk you dry. I'm going to make you pay with your ass. I'll get your ass. He keeps he keeps saying that stuff. Like, it goes on for a really long time. So then they fight and, like, the principal's on the ground going, Oh my god. Ugh. And then they have an edgy conversation. Then afterwards, there's a group of Tumblr emos, like the goths who go up to... Damien and they're like, they think he's Satan, so they're like, Lord Satan, make us your minions. And then Damien turns at them to Ash and murders them. And keep in mind, everyone is still in the room at the time, like all of the teenagers and the principal and everyone's just watching this happen and they don't do anything. He, he constantly, Brett constantly forgets how many people are in the room when he's writing. So he writes as if he expects you to know how many people are there when you haven't been told. And then when he finally tells you, you're like, why didn't you say that earlier? It's the same thing with the passage of time as well, you have absolutely no idea. The writing randomly goes from past tense to present tense and then back to past tense again. There's this one character who is a crippled child and it, the, the child doesn't have a name, it's just the crippled child. Even when you know the child's crippled, they still refer to it as the crippled child. Um, Brett has his music playlist playing, so it's just, it's edgy stuff like Pantera, Megadeth, um, Slayer, Ozzy Osbourne, like, as you can see, I am not saying that I dislike that music, I do not, in fact I am quite fond of it. I'm more into, like, melodic rock, like Tesseract, or stuff like that, El Ghost. But, but the point is, he has sentences where it's like, the fight, like, they started to fight, and Megadeth's blah 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 was playing on the radio. Those are actual sentences he has, and not only that, but when there's big action scenes, like fight scenes, he writes the actual sentence. The fight seemed to sync up with the rock music. He writes that sentence. He syncs it up with the heavy metal in his book. Like, he actually, ugh. He'll have Damien driving, and then he'll be like, like, he got into his black Cadillac while Megadeth played on the radio, and he's like, sentences go for entire paragraphs with no breaks. No breaks and a million commas, and it's so bad. This is the moment that you've all been waiting for. Now, if you have stuck with me this far, thank you. But now we are really going to get into the plot. I will be reading all of this, and... All of this is an honest representation of what is going on. I did not tamper with any of the plot whatsoever. I simply wrote it down as I was going through. So it doesn't make sense. It's not the way that I wrote it. It is the way that the book itself is written. If you have to check out at some point because you are completely just mind blown at how terrible this is, I completely understand and I thank you for sticking with me so far. If you're strong enough to get through this, then you should get a trophy. The plot from the beginning. Let me just, let me just become more of a narrator. Let me just get my appropriate narrator voice. So the teenagers are chilling in their little cliques before class when a black Cadillac pulls up. Some of them are too busy bullying a kid and don't notice the car, but then some of them do and notice this blood coming from the exhaust. The car then drives up to the black kids on the street and one of them, a girl, tries to climb through the car window to see who's inside. The car then drives off with her and she isn't seen again for a lot of the story. Then the windows explode in class and no one really cares. They go into the cafeteria and the black Cadillac drives up, reaching the school. Everyone is standing in the cafeteria when Damien bursts through. He is coming here specifically to see the character with the Jesus Saved shirted character called Christian. They have a confrontation and he disappears, only to teleport back into the school, like five minutes later. The principal then gets super mad and has a fight with him, losing. They have an edgy conversation. Meanwhile, Christian is having a blossoming romance with one of the characters called Amy, who we never really see again even though it's treated as though she's the main character. It doesn't really matter though. Damien says that his plan is to take over the town of Quiet Meadows, Missouri, where the story takes place. For some reason. A group of emos are trying to be recruited by him, but he turns them to ash, and no one really seems to care, and then walks out the doors and drives away. 
Reggie, one of the black guys from before, saw Damien disappear. He runs up to Amy and asks her what's going on. They have an energy conversation and then realize that Christian has vanished. They see that the principal has called in some cops and those cops are having a conversation with him so they go over and listen. The cops say that the story seems pretty strange because they're noticing some people are saying it's a black Cadillac and other people are saying that it's a white car. So one of the cops just says, give us the surveillance tapes and we'll be on our way. They then come back later with a detective and a sheriff. The sheriff introduces the detective as Detective Stalker, who is basically a ripoff of Elle from Death Note, Sherlock Holmes, and someone from True Detective, probably. He's been hunting Damien for about two years now and believes that Damien has supernatural powers, saying that the media has talked about his crimes for generations. However, each time, Damien has the ability to appear as someone else, so everyone thinks that he's a different person. It's the same demon every time. Stalker then launches into a background full of classified information that he should not be telling a witness of a crime, but does so anyway. This goes into Damien's backstory, showing how Damien's mother died and he was moved into foster care. And then when he, as he grew up, he met a girl they married. He saw, he came home one day to find out that she had cheated on him. He gets violent with the guy that she's cheating on him with and he goes to jail. When he gets out of jail, he spends the next two years trying to find his, his girlfriend and can't. Then one day she shows up in his house randomly with a kid who is crippled and she claims that the kid is crippled because the man she ran away with abused both of them. They live in harmony for a time, but then she disappears again. And he gets a bunch of boxes in the mail, each with one of her body parts. And then Damien is moved to an insane asylum. Then one day, they find Damien in, an, in the parking lot of the insane asylum, crucified with a white shirt that says Jesus saves, and that's never addressed. Then Damien escapes, and Stalker begins his investigation. Meanwhile, Damien is in his black Cadillac while this is happening, having successfully gotten away from the high school and now he is being chased by the police. There are about 10 police cars and he leads them on a chase to the woods. He then gets out of the car and so do they, only to panic as he sets fire to everything around him and runs and like drives out of the flames and all of the police die. As he's driving along he gets to a cliff face, he drives along the cliff face and the white car smashes into him. He rolls down the cliff and even though he was perfectly fine when he drove through fire, now he's injured for some reason. The white car actually belongs to Christian. Christian gets out of the car, revealing that he is in fact Lucifer and saying that he is the other half of Damien and Damien needs to join him in order to reach his full potential. But Damien refuses. Christian then gets into his car and the car explodes to change into another car, and then he drives away. Damien can't go back into his car because it's totaled from driving off a cliff, so he goes and in inspects the cliff face. On the very edge of the cliff, there is a school for the mentally handicapped. Damien goes inside and starts throwing desks around in one of the rooms when a small blind child goes up to him saying that she can see him and she's dreamed about him even though she's blind so she can't see anything else. Damien takes pity on her and starts violently shaking her by the head, giving her sight, not only normal sight but demon sight so that she can see what he sees and know how he suffers. They have a conversation and she asks him to heal the other students. He goes on an edgy dialogue about how God should never have given them imperfections in the first place but then caves in and does so. Then there's a random cut to builders coming into the school saying that the property that the school is on has been bought by someone else and they have to take the school down. A lot of parents are very angry and one mum goes inside the classroom to call her son. She finds all of the students lying on the ground and covered in blood. They start chanting in a cult chant in unison about how great Damien is, saying that all of them have been healed. The mother goes outside to find this mysterious Damien, only to see him get into a black Cadillac that mysteriously repairs itself as he drives off and metal music plays. Back to the characters in the classroom, the teens are plotting for revenge against Damien and that's when a white car pulls up, revealing Christian and the black girl who disappeared from before. She says she's been raped and she has a giant swastika carved into her back. Christian then drives off saying that he's going to take her to the hospital. The same black guy from before runs up to a group of skinheads in the school and intends to just scare them with his gun. However, when he gets there, he accidentally shoots and kills one of them. Damien teleports in front of him. The black guy seems to be the only one who can see him. Damien says that he shouldn't kill anyone, saying, you're going to get your five minutes of fame, another nigger shoots up a school. I quote. The black guy gets angry and tries to shoot Damien, but the bullet seems to fire into another skinhead, killing him. The black guy fires again and kills some more of them and then shoots himself. Damien goes over to a different part of the school and stops time for some reason. 
then having a conversation with some guy called Fabian that makes no sense. Christian drives the black girl into a remote farmyard area. The black girl argues with him, wondering where she's going, and he reveals that he is in fact Lucifer again. He tosses a duffel bag of money at her and heals all of her wounds, saying that she has a chance to make up for all the sins she's committed if she works for him and helps track down Damien. The focus goes back to Damien, who is weak from healing all the kids and passed out for two weeks. He wakes up in the wilderness, where he's being taken care of a woman called Gamora, who is apparently a million years old. She talks to him about how he has a nice ass, and she reveals that Damien's wife ran away with Satan. Gamora tries to have sex with Damien, and he says no, and then they have sex in the river while he's trying to have a bath. Gamora prays to God for a sign, saying that if Damien is going to die, God should turn the river in front of her to blood to give her a sign that this is the case. The water then turns to blood. Damien walks down one of the hallways of the school and confronts Christian, and they start fighting. Christian then hypnotizes all of the people in the school, making them stare down at the fight from the bleachers in a trance-like state. One of the people standing there is Damien's wife. Damien gets upset. Christian starts teasing him again. Christian reveals that the wife signed away her soul to, to him and faked her own death so that Damien wouldn't go looking for her. Christian actually says that the reason that he became Lucifer and defied God is because heaven is boring because you can't watch movies or go to metal concerts. That is actually the reason. Hell opens up on the floor and Christian sends henchmen to try and fight Damien to push him in. Christian also pushes some of the teenagers and Damien's wife into the hell hole or whatever it is. One of the henchmen that Damien is fighting is revealed to be his father named Andrew. Andrew ends up killing Damien and then goes outside to smoke or something. Gamora then appears and talks to Andrew, saying that helping Lucifer is evil. Andrew says that his goal is to make people think God is evil by doing evil deeds and framing them on God, even though he just said, even though he actually says before that God is evil enough as it is or something. Christian comes in and reveals that the truth about Andrew. Andrew was actually the one who was crucified instead of Jesus all those years ago, and Jesus actually crept away convincing everyone that Andrew was Jesus and that they'd crucify the right person. So Jesus never died for their sins and humanity is on this endless time loop where they're constantly being punished because no one died for them or whatever. Lucifer says that due to his time, this time loop, he's always going to be invincible. And then Gamora instantly breaks the time loop and that plot point is abandoned. Almost there. There's another random character called David who's in an insane asylum and one of the doctors is talking to him about God as per usual. And then Lucifer just randomly comes in and sends demons in to kill everyone in the asylum and David starts raping the doctor that he was talking to. Then a bunch of God's angels teleport in and tell Lucifer that, that Lucifer's resources are draining and he only has like a few more resources left so God is going to kill him soon. And then the angel reveals that Fabian is dead, whoever the fuck that is. But then the angels leave and we follow them and it reveals that they're actually Gamora in disguise the whole time, trying to trick Lucifer into giving up. And Lucifer just figures it out so the entire scene was pointless. Then we go back to Damien. He's falling to hell because he's dying. And then he just teleports into purgatory and Fabian appears saying that Fabian's like, I'm your brother and I'm giving you time powers and your your wife didn't actually do all those things that you were tricked to believing she never did those things you just went insane because you have a brain tumor and that's why you ended up in the insane asylum seriously that that's what it says fabian brings damien back to life and then disappears damien teleports back to the high school he has two magic rings now which protects him by creating a ring of wolves that beat his enemies. In the high school currently at the football stadium there are a bunch of jocks drinking. They start having a fight with this one girl and they all start fighting. The girl gets knocked off the bleachers and breaks her neck on the ground. Then Damien appears in the football stadium and a bunch of demons follow him. The wolves and the demons fight and then there are randomly two dragons that appear and do nothing and then teleport away. Actual Satan and Lilith are there and they're just watching everything and then they fuck off as well. The girl that died actually gets turned into a wolf and is like a guardian because God turned her into one or something. Then we switch to Satan's perspective. Satan goes home and Lilith goes to feed and by feed she needs to eat babies. She lets a dragon loose and it starts terrorizing the city. Then she goes to a hospital and wants to eat the babies. Damien chases after them and some Chinese dude teleports out of nowhere and says something. And Damien and him start fighting while Lilith still tries to eat the babies. She's in the nursery in the hospital and Christian appears. He gets angry with her and then he 
feeds her to one of the dragons and she dies. Damien kills the Chinese man and then checks on the babies to make sure none of them are eaten. He goes on a tangent about why he loves kids and he's totally not creepy at all. And then a random demon pops up and teases Damien and tricks him into healing a sick baby so that Damien will become weakened and the demon then throws him out the window. Then Christian and Satan argue because Christian killed Lilith and Satan didn't want him to. So Satan and Christian have a fight to the death for the rank of the ultimate ruler of the underworld. Satan then dies. Christian becomes the new Satan. Damien wakes up on a bed in a pocket dimension that Gamora made and she goes on this massive tangent about things that don't matter. The exposition she gives lasts like five pages. Christian then meets some random demons and they have a stupid conversation recapping everything that went on. Then the Chinese dude is revealed to be still alive. Then a bunch of stupid people in a bar are listening to Detective Stalker, remember him, whining about how he can't solve a case. Some woman appears and gives him an envelope saying, you have to solve this case, and he's like, I can't do it. And she's like, yeah, you have to. And then he leaves the bar. She reappears in his car and gives him more exposition, telling him that he has the second sight and he can see visions of something. He then goes home and hacks into the FBI. He's looking for Damien's file. And then a red pentagram appears on his computer saying, fuck you, Stalker. And then he gets a call from his sister saying that she's in with a guy called Damien as her patient. And he's like, oh my god. So then it cuts to him doing some random thing at a church for some reason, and then it randomly cuts to him being at a court case as well. And then he finally, after all of that confusing stuff, goes to Quiet Meadows, where Damien is. And the entire town turns into Silent Hill. There's like blood dripping from the walls. There's weird ghost children, there's everything. And then he wakes up in a hospital bed, revealing that that was all the dream. He goes to the bathroom and there's a giant snake that tries to eat his dick. And then the hospital turns into Silent Hill. And then he wakes up again, revealing that that was a dream within a dream. The woman appears again and gives him the envelope. Then he finally wakes up for the final time and his sister tells him that he's been asleep for some time. He suddenly teleported to a crazy preacher. The preacher tries to kill him with a knife. Last page. The preacher tries to kill Stalker with a knife, but then it's revealed that Stalker is the good guy so the priest doesn't kill him. Then a bunch of stupid crazy fever dream stuff happens that I didn't keep track of, and Hell in Heaven decide to go to war on Earth, ending on a cliffhanger for book two, which I am not reading. So anyway, that's what's going on. Thank you for sticking around this far if you haven't tapped out. If you'd like me to do more book themed stuff or story themed stuff, let me know. I need to get a cup of tea and like bang my head against the wall. Thank you.